The Big Bang Theory is all about the expansion of the universe, from a dot to over 93 billion light years across. From 10 to the minus 36 seconds after the Big Bang, the universe had a section of rapid expansion. To do this, it would have to screw up the rule book. The term cosmic inflation became a buzzword for physical cosmologists in the 1990s. It refers to the period of incredible rapid expansion just after the Big Bang. From my previous video about the Big Bang, we know that the universe is expanding, but inflation is the key. Cosmic inflation resolves two major issues in cosmology. The first is a horizontal problem. The universe looks the same on both horizons. There hasn't really been a sufficient amount of time since the Big Bang for light to travel across the universe and back. How do two sides have almost the same temperature and cosmic microwave background radiation? The time required to transfer this information would be twice the age of the universe. If the universe expanded exponentially for a fraction of a second, it would mean that the entire universe had been in casual contact and was at equilibrium. The separate regions of the universe were once very close together, meaning that photons shared a common temperature despite the distance. The second issue is a flatness problem. First off, flatness is related to density. The density parameter measures the amount of matter in the universe that produces gravity. It is denoted by the Greek letter omega, and it is also known as the flatness parameter. Now the flatness parameter is defined in such a way that if omega equals 1, then space-time is completely flat. Before this idea of inflation though, there was a problem that the mass of the universe is very close to the critical mass. The critical mass of the universe is all about what happens next, whether it keeps expanding or it collapses in on itself. Both are equally as horrifying. Now if the universe started off with omega being less than 1, omega would decrease as the universe ages. If omega is greater than 1, omega would increase as the universe ages. Now the fact that it is somewhere between 0.1 and 1 today means that in the first second of existence, Omega was almost 1, in fact it was 1 over 10 to the 60 away. Just on a quick side note, this is actually the most precise determined number in all of science. But anyway, because it is so close to 1, this has two very important implications. A. There is a lot of dark matter in the universe. And B. The universe was made flat by inflation. Imagine like a bed sheet, when it was first thrown over the bed, it's all curled up and then once you stretch it out to each corner, it becomes a lot smoother. That's kind of what it's like. Inflation is now used as a general term for models of the early universe which involves a rapid exponential expansion, where the universe grew from smaller than a proton to about the size of a grapefruit in a fraction of a second. This would smooth out the universe and also solve the issues with horizons as the area would have been incredibly close to each other to begin with and before it was pulled apart, thus solving the issue of looking in every direction and seeing the same sort of thing. While it gained precedence in 1990, it was actually established in the 1980s. It earned the success due to the fact that it solved so many issues about the nature of the universe. It united other theories and it worked with quantum theory which was developed independently by particle physicists and don't rely on any cosmological studies. In fact, it's safe to say that these theories about particles and quantum physics were developed without any consideration of how it would impact cosmology. So it was a smashing success. We have seen it before though, the marriage of the really small and the really large, but this is a big one, considered as the most important development in cosmological thinking since the discovery of the universe was expanding and that it was caused by the Big Bang. Let's look at the universe for what it is. The observed universe is expanding, which looking back points to one idea, that at some point it was a lot smaller. It implies that the universe was born out of singularity some 13.9 to 15 billion years ago. The actual age is still open for debate, but didn't really affect this argument. But quantum physics tells us that the extremes like a singularity with infinite density is meaningless. In fact, it suggests that the region from whence it came there's no bigger cross than the Planck length, about 10 to the minus 35 meters, and the density was not infinite, but 1,094 grams per cubic centimeter. 
So about a kilogram per cubic centimetre. These are actually the limits of size and density set by quantum physics. You can't get smaller and you can't get denser. This led to an idea, how could anything that dense expand? It would have a huge gravitational force which would hold everything in place and probably turn it into a black hole as soon as it appeared. But that leads to another part of inflation. It can prevent this from happening. It can stop large gravitational forces without even batting an eyelid. Quantum theory allows for many things. It allows for the entire universe to be viewed in its super compact form and appear out of nothing with zero energy overall. This very idea was developed by Edward Tryon at the City University of New York in the 1970s. He suggested that it all appeared out of vacuum fluctuations. It allowed for temporary bubbles of energy, or pairs of particles, to be created out of nothing, providing that they destroy themselves after a short period of time. The less energy that's involved means the longer that these bubbles can exist. So interestingly, the energy of the gravitational field is negative, due to the idea that you can only get to zero energy if you're an infinite amount of distance away, and the energy locked inside matter is positive. So if the universe was flat, these numbers would cancel out, and the overall energy of the universe is zero. And as the lower the energy level means for a long existence, zero energy means it can live forever. But I haven't really explained why inflation can stop the universe's own gravity from crushing it right from the off the reason are scalar fields, and it was these that split the grand unified force into the four fundamental forces we have today. It works as a kind of anti-gravity. It forces things away from each other. So what happened right at the start was that gravity splits off while the universe is still in its Planck length form. Within about 10 to the minus 32 seconds, the scalar fields would have done all their work and would have doubled the size of the universe every 10 to the minus 34 seconds. That means that the universe doubled inside 100 times by the time it got to the point where the scalar field had done its job. Once kick started, the universe was moving too quick for gravity to even catch up with it. And when it does, it will take hundreds of billions of years to halt the expansion and reverse it. Funny enough, this was one of the first ideas proposed way back in 1917 by Wilhelm de Sitter. His idea was only a mere mathematical curiosity with no relevance to the actual universe, but now it is one of the cornerstones of cosmology. However, there is one problem. Light takes 30 billionths of a second to travel a single centimetre, yet the universe expanded from a lot smaller than a proton to about 10 centimetre across in less time. So the, universe, so the universe expanded quicker than the speed of light. That might be a problem as nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. It's the cosmological speed limit. But it is possible because it's space-time itself which was expanding. That means that nothing in the universe was moving faster than the speed of light. It was the fabric of the universe. There is an interesting bit of history about inflation too. In the 1970s, a Russian scientist named Alexei Starobinsky came up with a theory which came to be known as the Starobinsky model. However, because of the Soviet Union at that time, he couldn't communicate with other universities outside of the Soviet Union. Nobody knew anything about his theory. The theory was based upon complex ideas about quantum gravity, which made it really difficult to understand. Then in 1981, Alan Guth at MIT came up with his own work on inflation without even knowing about Starobinsky's work. His work was more accessible in both senses of the word, he used the idea of inflation, which is a lot easier to understand, and being in the US allowed other universities to get the information and it became widespread. Then in October in 1981, there was an international meeting in Moscow, where inflation was a major talking point. Stephen Hawking himself even presented his paper claiming that inflation could never work at all, but a Russian cosmologist, Andrei Lindy, presented his new and improved version, appropriately named New Inflation which got around all the difficulties in the Goethe version. Ironically, Lindy was the official translator for Stephen Hawking's talk, which led him to having an embarrassing task of offering the audience with the counter-argument to his own work. However, after the meeting, Hawking was persuaded that Lindy was correct and inflation could work after all. Of course, the theory is still evolving today with additions such as chaotic inflation, which doesn't have anything to do with chaos theory, just to clear that up. 
In fact, it went under intense scrutiny recently when the Bicep 2 telescope in Antarctica thought they had disproved it, but it turned out to be cosmic dust, which had skewed the readings. Maybe one day there will be a complete theory for the early universe, but until then, this will have to do. Thank you so much for listening to the course. I hope you learned a lot about modern physics. I know I did just making these videos. It has been really fun for me to make, although very tough. I would just like to thank all the people that have helped me out making these videos. A big thanks to Curious as well. Thanks very much.